I think it is clear to believe in the power of ideas. Fresh, thank you for the Manhattan Institute. Thank you so much, and feel free to continue with coffee and dessert as we continue with our program. I, I'd like to recognize very quickly three scholars who are part of the Project for New Philanthropy, also supported by uh, Dick Cornell. With us from that project are Bill Dennis from the Atlas Economic Research Institute uh, and uh, Jeffrey Friedman of Critical Review. A tremendous journal that I re recommend to your attention. I'd also like to recognize two supporters of this program who have continued in the historic tradition started by Dick Cornell. First and foremost, our friends at the William E. Simon Foundation, Jim Pearson, the president. And Nick, Nick O'Neill of the O'Neill Foundation. Nick. Now it's time to turn to the presentation of the awards for social entrepreneurship. First, a word about our selection process. We solicit nominations from all over the country, but we accept nominations only from donors, those who have already expressed a belief in the value of the organization by putting their money in it. And we review the nominations in consultation with our advisory committee including Leslie Lankowski of the Center for Philanthropy at Indiana University, Anna Meyerson of the Philanthropy Roundtable. Adam is here. <laughs> Cheryl Keller, past program officer at the Smith Richardson Foundation. Cheryl is here. <laughs> Anne Marie Burgoyne of the Draper Richards Foundation, Jim Pearson and Sheer Sheila Mulcahy of the Simon Foundation, and Bill Shambra of the Bradley Center on Philanthropy and Civic Renewal. We identify 10 finalist programs, and either I or my colleague Cheryl Keller conducts a site visit at each prior to our final vote. Every year, we're just a little amazed at the wide range of strong nominations of organizations taking on America's naughtiest social problems, and this year was no exception. And now for our winners. There are not many organizations which could say and prove that they are saving lives, saving dollars, and doing their part to protect the environment. One organization that can is our first award winner, MedWish International, a beacon of hope for those in poor countries around the world needing medicine and medical equipment and a sign of rebirth amongst the abandoned factories of Cleveland, Ohio, where I was born and raised. The idea for MedWish began when its founder, Lee Ponsky, was a summer volunteer at a Cleveland hospital. And when he became a successful oncological surgeon, he had not forgotten that idea. He saw that hospitals were regularly discarding perfectly good equipment, still in its original packaging, just because American innovation was consistently coming up with new and better equipment. And he saw from his own experience at a hospital in Nigeria that what otherwise might be dumped in a landfill in the United States could be used to save lives and spread goodwill. Today, with Dr. Ponsky as its chairman and Tish Dahl as its executive director, and thanks to dozens of volunteers, the medical surplus that would otherwise go to the waste dump occupies 38,000 square feet of floor-to-ceiling warehouse space in what would have been an abandoned factory in Cleveland. You can find everything from toothbrushes to sutures to hospital beds to neonatal incubators to kidney dialysis machines and heart-lung machines bound for Africa, Central America, South Asia, 
and the Middle East where they have been specifically requested by physicians who guarantee their effective use. When the earthquake happened in Haiti, Medwish sent more than $5 million worth of equipment, and because they had already been working in Haiti, they were some of the supplies that really got through. There are many people alive today because of what Lee Potsky has done in the operating room, and even more alive because he founded Medwish International. Ladies and gentlemen, nominated by Pamela Holmes of the Cleveland Clinic Foundation, please join me in welcoming Dr. Lee Ponsky. Wow, what an introduction. I can assure you that made my mom happy who's here tonight. <laughs> thank you, Howard. I appreciate it. First off, I want to thank Howard and the Manhattan Institute for this really prestigious and much appreciated uh, award. I uh, feel very humbled to be in the, in the same category with some of the other recipients and Mr. Canada. It's a real privilege. Um, you know, 18 years ago, it was a different time for me. Um, I was idealistic. I was young. And I was completely naive as to what a nonprofit was. It turns out that happens to be the exact ingredients for a successful nonprofit organization. <laughs> and I would recommend it to all the young folks out there. The, when I had the opportunity to go to Africa in Nigeria, I boarded a plane to go and do something that I just had a dream of doing. I wanted to go somewhere I felt I was useful. And I boarded a plane, not knowing exactly where I was going. I was in college at the time, and I not, didn't know exactly what I was going to be doing. And again, my mom was thrilled about that. <laughs> but it was there that my aha moment came and took place. It was there that I saw that we were in a clinic in the middle of Africa, Bomashan, Nigeria, and we were washing out the rubber gloves that we had used in the day before for the surgery. Can you imagine? We were washing out syringes we had used the day before because that's what we had. People were showing up to the emergency department and we were requesting, did you bring your supplies to be treated? And if you didn't, we are ser seriously sorry. We can't treat you. It was there, as a college student, I had a woman die in my hand, die in my hand, because we didn't have the supplies to treat her that I knew we had excess of and we were throwing away in the US. Thus my aha moment. Again, young, naive, and uh, idealistic. I came back to the US, graduated college, and before starting medical school, it just became a no-brainer. It was kind of like seeing a blind man who needs to cross the road. You don't even think about it. You help him across the road. And that's what we did with Medwish. We started an organization that just made sense. In 1993, we started our organization, and from 93 to 2001, we ran the organization with just volunteers. We had no funding. That's not true. We got a $300 check from someone, and we still have it in the bank because I wasn't sure what to do with it. <laughs> someone gave me a check, and I wasn't sure how even we found that check recently. 2001, some people came to us, and I, at this point, I was going through my medical training and pretty busy, and someone said, you know, we should really kind of pick up the pace here, we should do something more significant. We were sending duffel bags around the world to people who were traveling lo from our local hospitals, and it was great. I thought we were doing a good thing. At that point, we got an, uh, our first executive director, and from that point, from 2001 till now, we now have a staff of eight. We have a almost 40,000 square foot warehouse. We've sent supplies to over 90 countries around the world. We now went from duffel bags to 40-foot containers. Um, we still haven't forgot our roots, though. We still send the duffel bags to those who want it, people who have families in different areas and want to bring a little representation of help and support. We're not religiously or politically affiliated. And interesting, when Howard came out, he used a term that I've now coined, and I've, I give you credit, I promise, called collateral benefit. And one of the things that I'm actually most proud of, besides the lives that we're affecting around the world, is the collateral benefit of the programs we have in Medwish with our special needs program. We have autistic kids in our warehouse on an every, every single day. And we have people with special needs in our warehouse every single day. And it's amazing the win-win situation. They help us. They provide us with a significant benefit. But at the same time, we're helping them. It literally will bring tears to your eyes as go through the warehouse and see these children 
and adults with needs who are being socialized and learn how it, what it's like to be socialized in a working environment. They learn a skill and they learn something they can be proud of and I think it's really spectacular and I, and I think the term collateral benefit really goes a long way to describing that. So we, we have gone from a time where we send the most basic supplies to sending big 40 foot containers but even our small boxes make a difference. Just about a year ago, we sent a small box in one of our board members' uh, briefcases with a heart valve, and it went into Suyapa Flores's 14-year-old heart and literally saved her life. Now, we don't know all of our recipients, and we don't all the know all the lives that we're saving, but we're in the business of saving lives and repurposing supplies. People ask me about the time I had my aha moment. I didn't really realize it was an aha moment. But what I respond to people is, it's not the aha moment. It's what you do with that aha moment. And I'd like to take this opportunity with so many people here with doing so many great things. For those of you who have been here and haven't had your aha moment, I'd like to invite you to share my aha moment. And I'd like you to join us if you're interested in what we're doing, to join us. Uh, we can use support both financially, volunteer-wise. If you know people around the world who need support, you want to reach out, join us, and we welcome your, your support. You can join us on medical brigades to visit some of the clinics we support around the world. I can tell you that this type of recognition, we're humbled by it, um, and I think that it goes a long way to recognize that when people have an idea, just do it. Someone once told me, find a need and fill it, and I think that's what we're doing, and I really, again, want to congratulate my co-recipients for the great honor. Thank you. As a 16-year-old high school student on Long Island, our next award winner, inspired by concern about her own grandmother, organized a school volunteer project designed to bring companionship and a touch of beauty to an often isolated population, elderly women confined to nursing homes. The first glamour gals were Rachel Doyle's high school classmates. They would provide regular makeovers, including facials and manicures, to brighten the days of those they visited. Today, after Rachel went on to get a public policy degree at Cornell, appear on the Oprah Winfrey program, she leads a national Glamour Gals organization that includes 2,100 members, 60 chapters in 14 states, and whose teenage volunteers have given an estimated 75,000 hours of service over just the past two years. And for her part, Rachel left behind a successful career in advertising because she found she couldn't just give up Glamour Gals. In assessing the effectiveness of an organization, we tend appropriately to focus on results, client served, cost per client. But it's also true that some acts of personal charity and loving kindness are ends in themselves. And one of, the, one of them must surely include making a way for the girls from St. Joseph's Catholic School in Brooklyn, some of whom were previously involved in gangs, some being raised by their own grandparents, to volunteer at a nursing home which didn't otherwise get a lot of visitors. And I watched them go from one resident to another at the Cobble Hill Community Health Center, providing splashes of color to the white hair and the pale skin of those who spend most of their lives indoors. It became clear that the relationship established there is more important than makeup. The one who makes those relationships possible from Comac, Long Island, nominated by Louis Valerio of the Progressive Financial Services Company, Rachel Doyle. I want to thank the Manhattan Institute for this wonderful honor. Congratulations to the other awardees. And also to Lou Valerio, my executive board member for the nomination. And my colleague, Kavita, who's here. My other colleague, Julia, is actually in Indiana. Shout out to <laughs> Indiana. As well as the guests this evening. I'd like to begin by reading an excerpt from an acceptance speech given by one of our volunteers at our annual volunteer awards. Glamour Gals was the most important and memorable part of my high school career. 
It taught me the value of compassion and how acts of kindness can really go a long way. Glamour Gals has been more than makeovers and manicures for me. Instead, it has been a blessing as a new friend to many elderly residents, as well as a challenge as a leader, a thrill as a volunteer, and a life lesson on countless levels. I am a better person because of my experience with Glamour Gals. These phrases were shared by Tammy, a chapter president who through heartfelt tears during her acceptance speech was applauded for her many accomplishments, including recruiting over 100 volunteers to her chapter and how Glamour Gals changed her life. Some volunteers in our program, like Tammy, are natural leaders. Others are given the opportunity to discover their potential through the Glamour Gals experience. Just as an artist uses his paintbrush, a writer her pen, our volunteers use makeup as their tool. It is with this tool that they can bring beauty and dignity to the elderly through the squeeze of a frail hand, accompanied by the words, you matter to me. You look beautiful today. And while doing so, are transformed by the experience and inspired to do more. Each volunteer has her own story to share. As Boshiana wrote in her Glamour Gals journal, I'm appreciative for my time with the ladies because they have enabled me to gain virtues that have ultimately made me into the person I am today. A woman that I can never forget reminded me of why I decided to become a part of Glamour Gals. She became such a close friend to me I never allowed myself to miss an opportunity to give her a manicure. Whenever we met, we spent most of the time laughing and talking about life. Unfortunately, this wonderful woman passed away unexpectedly. Her name was Phyllis. Phyllis allowed me to gain the irreplaceable qualities within myself. Becoming a leader in this program will always remain a huge part of my life. I would never trade my experience for anything else. Many volunteers like Boshiana are given opportunities to discover the potential through Glamour Gals. Despite coming from homes whose parents were incarcerated, have connections to gangs, were ridden off by their schools as failures, I have personally met these girls who have not only found compassion in their lives, but they have found a future. Breaking up with that boyfriend in a gang deciding to maybe attend English class and write that essay about Glamour Gals, then use that essay to apply for college and then win a scholarship to college with that essay. These critical life transformations were based on the most genuine acts of kindness, a compliment shared, an embrace given, a smile exchanged between two generations. For many of us, the emotional baggage that sometimes comes with aging can be devastating. Watching our loved ones, your mom, a spouse of 50 years, a best friend turn to you and say, do I know you? These phrases are not just once a day, but repeated 10 times an hour. The result, the visitor's parking lot at many senior homes remain empty. Yet each week, for over a decade, volunteers like Tammy, Boshiana, and thousands of others have brought a voice to a population too frail to join the community beyond their walls. It is through the tools of makeup that we, Glamour Gals volunteers, are able to lift the curtain that divides two generations and provide a stage and an audience to the forgotten and the frail. For some volunteers, these second acts are not always easy. Another Glamour Gals volunteer shared. Her name was Faye. I called her Purple Sweater Faye. She sat quietly as I greeted her with her hands clasped and didn't move except for a nod of her head. For about an hour, I smiled, I chirped about school, embraced her, applied rouge to her cheeks and dabbed lipstick on her lips and complimented her smooth skin, and yet she didn't smile. I double checked with the activities coordinator. Does Faye want a makeover today? <laughs> and she nodded yes. 
Yet I left that makeover feeling like a failure. It was the first time a woman had not even smiled back at me. That evening, I received an act a call from the activities coordinator. I got nervous. I thought maybe I was in trouble. As we were discussing the makeover, Purple Sweater Faye entered the conversation. The coordinator informed me that that was the reason she was calling. She shared, Faye had been severely depressed and had stopped eating, and after our makeover, she picked up her fork. The volunteer was 17 years old. Her name was Rachel Doyle, and her life was changed. Thank you. Don't forget that. I really like doing this. <laughs> at, at the same time our nation faces high unemployment, we also find today that many employers can't find employees with the skills that our modern economy requires. Our next award winner is doing something about that through an important new institution in American life, the charter school. Ann Higdon runs such a school for those who had previously completely dropped out of high school. She set out to help them rebuild their lives when she set up her first job training classroom in a trailer on the street in one of Dayton, Ohio's poorest neighborhoods, symbolically close to the site of the Wright Brothers' original bicycle shop. A true entrepreneur, Ann started out by taking out a personal bank loan for $100,000. Thanks to the crucial support she got when she needed it most from Dayton's Rotary Club, Improved Solutions for Urban Systems, the organization that she founded, has blazed a new approach for charter schools, one that provides a combination of academic and field-oriented vocational training for 330 of Dayton's most difficult-to-reach students, most of whom had previously been involved in the juvenile court system. Today, ISIS uses a renovated factory building that's a motif tonight, to train students in the skills that Dayton needs today, healthcare, construction, computer technology, high-end manufacturing. One measure of her success, based on the results of the Ohio high school exit exam, the ISIS charter school is consistently ranked in the top five of all 62 high schools of any kind in metropolitan Dayton. Ann Higdon's own story is a source of inspiration for her students whom she can tell about the ways in which hard work can pay off. This daughter of Harlem once scrubbed floors herself to put herself through college, and she's never forgotten where she came from. Ladies and gentlemen, from Dayton, Ohio, nominated by Brad Gamblin of the Dayton Rotary, Ann Higdon. This is really special because when I was about 13, my father looked me in the eye and said, Ann, you'll never amount to nothing. <laughs> I was first homeless when I was four. And um, through my career, I got to work with some smart people, learned a lot, paid attention, and I thought I knew something about rising against all odds and created uh -huh. ISIS for young people who were dropping out of school. There was an article in the newspaper in Dayton that said 62% of our kids drop out of school without graduating. And the next systems they see are the juvenile justice system and the welfare system. And then I read an article that said, among the Appalachian heritage young people in our area, more than 60% of them drop out in middle school. So they never made it to high school. When I went around telling people that I was gonna create a school for young people, not to get a GED, but to earn a high school diploma. And then I wanted to segue them into careers and college and I thought that they could practice their skills by doing something of value in the community. Nobody listened to me, and so I borrowed the money because they thought I was crazy. <laughs> Our young people who are in construction technology have built 60 homes, wraparound porches, <laughs> vaulted ceilings, a replica of the Wright Brothers homestead. They're now building a replica of the Thomas Edison Menlo Park, and they're building it so that it generates all the energy that it uses. 
Our healthcare students volunteer in hospitals and nursing homes. Our computer tech students refurbish computers that we give to poor kids that live in the city. Our advanced manufacturing students operate an automated manufacturing facility and create all the walls. That, that plant has the capacity of, of building all the walls for seven 2,000 square foot homes in one shift. In addition to that, this year, the Department of Education ranked each of our three schools as excellent. And the Fordham Foundation ranked the schools on performance in Dayton out of all 59. Our one reviewer called the young people overaged, underachieving, non-attending, court-involved, disciplinary problem young people. Well, this year, these young people ranked first highest performing, second highest performing school, and third highest performing. And so they said, so what do you think of me now? <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah. You know, a century ago, just as we are today, America was in the midst of a wave of immigration. At that time, in the early 20th century, idealistic citizens took it upon themselves to help the newcomers, most of them poor, uneducated, and not able to speak English. Hundreds of settlement houses sprung up across the country, from Hull House in Chicago to the Henry Street Settlement right here on the Lower East Side. They offered free English classes, knowing then, that as it is today, English is a key to upward mobility. And our next award winner, Miley Hickey, is reinventing this tradition at the organization she founded in Austin, Texas, English at Work. She started by offering classes on her own to immigrants among her co-workers at an esteemed educational institution, Guero's Taco Bar. <laughs> that was where she was working at the time. After getting her master's degree at the LBJ School at the University of Texas, she's gone on to provide through English at Work twice weekly 90-minute classes in English and other job-related skills at 17 major Austin employers, including Whole Foods, Hilton Hotels, three major hospitals. Employers provide the space, and they allow for the time. Graduates have gone on to job promotions, high school equivalency degrees, higher wages. No one can doubt that the need is great. Of the 37 million foreign-born Americans, take in that number, only half report being able to speak English fluently, which is why Miley Hickey is fielding inquiries from around the country about how to start workplace English classes. And by the way, those classes at Guero's are still going strong. Ladies and gentlemen, nominated by Laura Galinsky of the Echoing Green Foundation from Austin, Texas, Miley Hickey. Sorry to have to correct you, Howard, but my name is actually Miley Broccoli Hickey. <laughs> and if anybody wants to hear about that later, I'm happy to tell you that immigration story. <clears throat> I founded English at Work six years ago because I had to do something about the fact that Austin's immigrant workforce didn't have a voice. Since 2005, we've brought customized English classes to 750 immigrant workers at 30 companies. Howard said 17, and Cheryl told me I needed to update the website, but obviously I didn't listen. <laughs> 750 folks at 30 companies in Austin. I want to thank Laurie Winfield, tonight our board president, for her fantastic, <laughs> also filming, for her fantastic leadership. I also want to thank um, Andy and Karen White, who were able to come tonight. I also wanted to thank Echoing Green, who has been the single most important partner in my adventure as a social entrepreneur, and Lara Galinsky is here tonight, so thank you guys. I also want to thank Jeffrey Canada, and I'm sure, uh, maybe you didn't expect this, Jeff, I never thought I'd be able to thank you in person, but um, I learned from you early on the following lesson, that sometimes the boldest thing we can do as peacemakers, change makers, social entrepreneurs, 
is to honor the constraints within which we are operating, to be honest with our community about the sacrifices that some members of the community are going to have to make in order to move the most vulnerable members forward. Thank you so much for that early, early lesson. Tonight, I of course want to thank the Manhattan Institute for recognizing the great work that a handful of employers, employees, teachers, and community volunteers are doing in Austin. Like our illustrious governor, we have our sights set far beyond Texas. <laughs> unlike, unlike <laughs> Governor Perry, I think, we, I think we have a better handle on history, or at least historical dates, <laughs> compared to, to Perry. But I'm so pleased to count the Manhattan Institute as a partner in English at Works growth going forward. I want to tell you really quickly a story about one of our students tonight, because as we sat down to dinner tonight here in New York, Rosalinda, uh, one of our clients, sat down to a very special dinner herself. She graduated from the English at Work program yesterday. She is a housekeeper at Seton Northwest Hospital. She is in her 50s, and up until we met her, she thought that she was too old to learn English, and her family reinforced this belief. After doing a couple of months of English classes with us, Rosalinda's English had improved dramatically, so dramatically that when a patient came into the ER at Seton Northwest, Rosalinda was pulled in at the last minute to interpret for this patient because none of their uh, professional interpreters were available. She didn't want to do it at first, but because of the urgency of the situation, she started to interpret between Spanish and English. And she kept saying to the doctor, do you understand what I'm saying? Do you understand me? Because she wanted to be sure that what was wrong was getting across. And he said, I understand, I understand, but speak more quickly. Rosalinda has also told us that when she goes to the bank now, she leaves her son in the car, whereas before, she would bring him into the bank with her to interpret. But the special dinner she's having tonight has to do with the following. Uh, Rosalinda has told her immediate family that she is is now an English speaker, but her extended family doesn't know that. And so she has invited everybody to dinner tonight at an English-speaking restaurant in Austin where she will reveal her new English skills. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you again, Howard and Cheryl and the Manhattan Institute for helping English at Work reach out to the hundreds and thousands of other Rosalindas that we will impact over the next few years. Thank you, Miley. Each year in the United States, about 800,000 individuals are released from prison. You heard that right, 800,000 of a prison population of more than two million. That's the number leaving. Tragically, as many as two-thirds may ultimately wind up back behind bars. I should note this is an issue in which the Manhattan Institute has taken a special interest through our own work with Mayor Cory Booker in Newark, New Jersey. Our next award winner is leading the way in reducing prison recidivism and in, de in developing an effective approach to doing so from which the whole country can learn. In just four years since Barbara Elliott founded the Work Faith Connection in Houston, Texas, it has graduated 1,036 men and women, 78% of whom are employed with some one of 450 different employers earning on an average of more than $9 an hour. They came referred by churches, by homeless shelters, by the courts, all familiar with the work faith approach, one that emphasizes the importance of getting and keeping a job, even an entry level job, staying with it for at least a year and moving on up from there. But work faith counseling and mentoring doesn't end with the first job. It's dedicated staff likes to say they will stick with you through your first promotion. Numbers are important here, but they don't do justice to the human stories of lives reclaimed, of drug use halted, of fathers visiting with children. Barbara Elliott has long been a major figure among those who see the potential for faith-inspired organizations to help the urban poor. She's the author of Street Saints, Renewing America's Cities. For her work with refugees and the poor, President George W. Bush presented her with the Eleanor Roosevelt Award for Human Rights in 2001. And like the very best social entrepreneurs, Barbara Elliott understood that she could not build a new institution alone. She's joined tonight by the woman who has served as chief operating officer of the Work Faith Connection since it opened its doors in 2007. A successful businesswoman before that, Sandy Schultz. And together, they've taken on the project to help the men and women they call the hardest of the hard. 
Ladies and gentlemen, nominated by Stan Merrick of the Merrick Family Companies, please join me in honoring Barbara Elliott and Sandy Schultz. for the very kind introduction. You have noticed that I am only Barbara and not Sandy. Sandy is over there. Um, she is actually the person who makes it all work, but I have the honor of accepting this on behalf of both of us. Thank you, Howard. Thank you, Cheryl. Thank you, all of you with the Manhattan Institute and all of you who are here to celebrate with us. I am awed by the stories I have heard this evening. It really is an amazing honor and an amazing thing to see that there is an institution that is devoted to lifting up these grassroots endeavors and bringing, them, bringing these gems into the light. It really is quite remarkable. I didn't really set out to be a social entrepreneur. Um, I was happily moving along in the conservative movement, kind of doing academic or political things. And I did something dangerous about 1989. For the first time in my life, I actually asked God what he would like me to do. And if you ever pray that and mean it, I mean, look out. You are likely to get certain places you had no intention of going. Uh, in my case, my first assignment was to go and take care of refugees who were fleeing communism about the time the Berlin Wall came down. And I was living in Germany at the time and didn't really know how to do that, but said, all right, I will try. Um, and with a kind of a heart that just says, you know, if there's a problem, see what you can do about it, was given the privilege of caring for those people who were in transition. Well, fast forward to 1996, and I'm back in the United States and saying, okay, what now? I'm ready for the next assignment. And the assignment was go to the inner cities of America and find good people there who are restoring lives in faith. I thought, right, I do dinner parties. I don't know how to do the inner city. It's like not my natural habitat. But it's where I've been ever since. Um, and it's a journey that's taken me into homeless shelters and into prisons and into drug treatment centers, and I have some of the most interesting friends you can imagine. I can be safe lots of places. <laughs> Guys who've been in prison, gang members, I mean, it's a very interesting group. But what I've discovered is this, there are people whose lives have been restored by love and by faith, and with the intervention of people who are willing to go into their lives long enough to have a relationship over time that it changes them that you can actually lift people to their feet and give them the dignity of a new life and love them into wholeness. That's really all that we do at the Work Faith Connection. I've discovered along the way, first of all, you need to learn from good teachers. And one of them is here in the room this evening. Adam Meyerson was one of the first people who back in the 80s and 90s was teaching me about the value of civil society. And I learned from Robert Woodson. I went and spent time with him and said, teach me what it is that works. How do you find the things in the inner city that are good? I spent some time with Marvin Olasky, who kind of uh, anointed me as his disciple and said, go, my child, and write. Uh, it's been amazing to learn from all of you who've gone before me. And the little part that I get to play now is to just pass some of the wisdom along. Two things I've learned in terms of organizations that work well. One, relational over time. That equation seems to be truly transformational. If you can have a face-to-face -face relationship with somebody whose name you know, and you have a relationship with them over the course of an entire year, whether it's an at-risk child or somebody just coming out of prison or somebody leaving drugs, it changes lives. And it's mutually transformational. And the second thing I learned is that faith is an important element of sustained transformation. If people are leaving drugs or leaving prison, there is a reason that those faith-based programs that are truly those of integrity have better numbers. And for people who don't understand the reasons behind it, it doesn't matter. If you just want to look at the sociological research, read Byron Johnson. Read the things the Templeton Foundation is putting out. It's amazing. The relationship between faith and transformation is real. So with those two things in mind, when we started the Work Faith Connection, it wasn't just about getting people jobs. We wanted them to have a whole new life, 
A job is one step. A whole new life is the goal. Another important thing I learned along the way is you have to have really good people. So Sandy Schultz is a person who has been actually putting this into effect ever since the beginning. Sandy, I'd like to acknowledge her right now. Would you please applaud her? <laughs> Sandy, stand up. <laughs> there she is. Sandy is the reason that this organization has flourished. Um, her career in business before, she had the combination of the kind of a heart, but also the practical savvy. We not only get people ready to work, they have to be employable, so she knew what employers were looking for. Um, we also had the combination of street smarts on our staff. Um, we had at one point about half of our employees were people from the program. I think it's about a third now as we've opened a second location and had to put on some accountants and various things. But I'm very happy to say that this evening we get to celebrate the success of one of our graduates. Asa Marie Thompson is here with us. She was a graduate of our program. She was on our staff for a couple years and now she has come back to New York and she is in university now studying. Asa Marie, to you. Asa Marie is one of 1,400 people who have gone through our program now. Even more have graduated since we turned in the numbers, and it just continues to grow. We get to see transformed lives. We get to see the joy and the hope in their eyes. Um, I speak at every one of the graduations, and I get to hug every one of them. I haven't hugged so many felons since I worked in Washington. <laughs> but we get to see the real joy of people who are restored, people who have the dignity of a job, people who leave public assistance, who purchase a car, who are restored in a relationship with their children, with children who have been taken away by CPS. It's amazing. And some of the so-called hardest to place are some of the most grateful employees. They're being advanced in their profession. They're now supervisors. I just want to say for all of you who are here, you are participating in something that is so amazingly important for this entire nation, not just for Austin and Houston and all the cities we've come from. What this is doing, what all of us are doing, is knitting together the fabric of our civil society, which has been tattered of late. And these initiatives, every one of them, is building these face-to-face -face relationships at a community level that transforms not only the person who's being served, but those of us who have the privilege of serving. And that's really what it means to be the kind of American who values our heritage, the kind of American that Alexis de Tocqueville discovered when he came to this country, and the kind of people who actually take care of one another, not because the government has mandated us to, but because it comes from our heart. In the end, it's all about love. Thank you for the award. I'd like to acknowledge two past award winners who are here with us tonight. James Hunter of the New Jersey Orators. And David Umansky of Civic Builders. Is David here? He was here, okay. We now turn to our award for lifetime achievement in social entrepreneurship, the William E. Simon Prize. In contrast to the $25,000 Cornell Awards intended to help build new and promising organizations, the Simon Prize, like the MacArthur Award, or dare I say the Nobel Prize, carries with it a $100,000 personal honorarium in recognition of the sacrifices which nonprofit leaders make over the long course of their careers. The context of tonight's award is what must be considered the most vexing and long-standing social problem in America, how to break the cycle of intergenerational, gen, intergenerational poverty affecting the African-American poor, or put another way, how to find ways to bring the black poor into the social and economic mainstream. We've long heard about some of the reasons that this challenge has proved so intractable, from family structure to 
inherent flaws in our economic system. We have seldom, far too seldom heard, however, about someone effectively doing something to uplift the African-American poor. More about 30 years ago, Jeffrey Canada began to do just that at the organization which became the Harlem Children's Zone. He started out working with the families in just a single building, then expanded to a single block. The Children's Zone now reaches more than 20,000 adults and children in a 97-block neighborhood in central Harlem. Rather than lamenting how far behind Harlem children are, even before they start school, Mr. Canada said, well, what if there were classes for parents to help them prepare their children? And today, the Children's Zone runs a baby college, guided by the world-famous pediatrician Barry Brazelton, which begins to counsel parents even before their children are born, as well as mounting programs for the parents of three-year-olds and pre-kindergartners. And rather than lamenting the poor performance, of predominantly black public schools, Mr. Canada has said, in effect, well, what if there were schools in central Harlem with high expectations, longer hours, and a culture of achievement? Today, at Promise Academy of One, one of four children's own charter schools, 100% of third graders scored at above grade level on the third grade math examination, and over 93% tested at or above grade level in English language arts outperforming <laughs> outperforming the statewide average for students of any race. And rather than lamenting the violence which plagues the streets in far too many minority neighborhoods, Jeffrey Cannon and the Harlem Children's Zone organized the Harlem Peacemakers to work in and around all neighborhood schools, not just the ones that they run, to protect the students in which such an important investment is being made. There is just so much more in the Children's Zone's ambitious and far-reaching effort to change and uplift a community. Chess classes, art classes after school, health clinics to deal with asthma and obesity, they are all joined by a vision that would have the culture of black America again be one of achievement and upward mobility. Like any organization that operates a charter school, the Children's Zone relies in part on government funding, but Jeffrey Canada's vision, and make no mistake, it is his vision, right, relies on private donors to a very significant extent, including dozens who have donated more than $1 million. I'm sorry that I have lost my notes. <laughs> but there really isn't that much more that needs to be said. Please join me in. <laughs> by me. <laughs> Please join me in welcoming the Simon Prize winner for this year, Jeffrey Canada. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, thank you, and uh, uh, let me start off by thanking the uh, William E. Simon Foundation and the entire Simon family. Uh, I want to thank uh, Paul Singer and uh, Larry Moan, uh, and obviously Howard for uh, all of the work that he's done in the trustees. Uh, so uh, there are a lot of people who are upset uh, with me, and, and I want to just be clear about this one thing, Howard, those, those scores were our scores until they changed the test, and so I always worry that people always think there's some fix in. So the scores did go down after that. Uh, they are still uh, 20 points higher than any of the scores in the public schools around. Uh, so uh, I just want to, people aren't, people, people are upset because I fundamentally believe that these poor kids in Harlem who have every social ill you can, you name one, we got it. 
right? Uh, gangs, yes. Violence, yes. Substance abuse, got that too. Uh, single, you know, families, yes, we have all of that. Some parents who don't care, we have all of that. All of my kids are going to go to college. Doesn't matter what the issues are because I'm paid to get those kids to go to college. That's my job, right? So it's not, it's not but I just want to say, but so you would ask yourself, well, why are people mad about that? Because people keep saying, Jeff, you can't say that. Don't you know where those kids come from? Don't you know all the problems they have in their life? Uh, how is it you're going to make a bold statement that all of your kids are going to go to college? Well, my kids are going to go to college uh, because everybody understands uh, that this is not about genetics, right? It's not that some folks are genetically uh, superior. This is about opportunities that young people get or don't have and what we're prepared to do. Now, I have been touched by everything I have heard today. Uh, it's one of the things that makes me so excited about this country we live in. I mean, you listen to the care, the concern, the personal responsibility people have taken on and make it a better place. But I'm on, look, I'm on a mission to make sure that we do away with this myth, right? Because people have believed this for far too long. Uh, and so I've got a big mouth. Uh, this is going to help me have a bigger mouth. Uh, I'm, I'm just so... <laughs> When y'all hear me yelling and screaming somewhere, take responsibility for it. Don't pretend y'all didn't come here tonight and say, <laughs> yeah, go ahead and do this. Uh, but because but it's, it's been, you know, it's been interesting. I was like, so my, I'm here with my wonderful wife, Yvonne, uh, and we've got four children and five grandkids together. Uh, and we're a team. Uh, we're, we're a team effort. But Yvonne grew up in Harlem. I grew up in the South Bronx. And we both know uh, that... Uh, you can, with hard work, save uh, all the kids. Uh, and unfortunately, we're losing kids all over this country. Now, I'll tell you uh, this uh, quickly. Uh, people have started to listen. Uh, and uh, one of the uh, things, you know, we've been on 60 Minutes two times, and I'll uh, say this one thing about 60 Minutes. So the second time we was on 60 Minutes, it was with Anderson Cooper. Uh, and Anderson came in, we were talking, was, everything was going fine, but... I had this issue in Harlem where two groups of kids were shooting. They were going up on the roofs in a housing project, and they were shooting at one another from one roof to the next, right? So maybe 100 yards separating the roofs. And I had a playground where I run programs uh, right between the two uh, warring groups. They live in the same housing project. Uh, and so my staff, of course, they're now getting really worried because they're like, Jeff, they're out there shooting. And I believe leadership is when... Right? Things go bad. The leaders show up and say to people, we are not ceding this territory. You are not going to turn uh, these young kids' lives into places where they have to duck bullets. So uh, I'm telling Anderson, look, uh, guys, we're going over there, and this we have to do every now and then. We have to just go to places and tell the thugs that they are not running our community. We're running this place. And Anderson said, that's great, Jeff. Let's film it. Now, how it's mentioned, I have to raise a lot of money. <laughs> so I have to admit that when uh, Anderson said that, I just said to myself, please, God, don't let them kill Anderson in Harlem, <laughs> all right? Because <laughs> America loves Anderson, and I won't be raising a lot of money if Anderson dies in Harlem fooling around with us. Uh, but this, this issue about... Uh, taking personal responsibility is something that uh, I believe. You know, I, I say these crazy things that get me in trouble, uh, such as uh, if you're a teacher and you can't teach, that maybe you should get another career, <laughs> right? Now, people, uh, wait, the, the, the blogs will be burning. Uh, there he goes again. So I didn't say... If, you, you know, you're a teacher and you can't teach, we're going to kill your dog. I just said, get another job. Now, what only in my profession would people consider that a radical statement, <laughs> right? That if we can prove you're lousy, right, that in my profession, you get to keep your job no matter what. And that's a crazy thing. So we're changing that. And I think the Manhattan Institute is one of the groups that are pushing on these issues because some of it is just, it doesn't make any sense. 
You know, so, so here's, here's some of the changes going on in America. Now, when I used to go in, I was doing some work in Newark uh, and in Camden. And I would go in and I would do my usual. You know, fire lousy teachers, close failing schools, hold the adults accountable, use merit pay. Right? These guys, and people would say, that Jeff, he is the most radical, revolutionary guy. We got to run him out of town. And then Governor Christie came to town. <laughs> now they say, bring back Jeff. That guy sounds really reasonable, right? So part of, part of you know, the, 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 the world we live in, unfortunately, in, in, in our business, is one where uh, there is a vested interest that we won't change no matter how many million children fail in this country. We simply will not change no matter. And if you try and change it, you are going to be targeted and people will look at every single thing to try and prove that you are not able to do what people are doing all over this country. And there, and there are other folks doing this. And so we believe in accountability. Uh, and we believe in holding the adults accountable. And so this is Harlem Children's Own Accountability. Uh, when I began to do my charter schools, when we first started, uh, I said to Mayor Bloomberg, and I said to Joel Klein, who was chancellor, and I said to my board, and to my parents, and to my community, if I don't have a better school, than the public schools in Harlem in five years, I'm going to fire myself, right? These schools have been lousy for 50 years. And if in five years I can't get a better school than every single one of those schools, I'm going to fire myself. People wrote it down. Jeff said five years, <laughs> he's going to fire himself. And then when they left, I got my entire staff in there. I said, but you all know I'm the last one leaving, <laughs> all right? So when we talk about accountability, we're talking about real accountability. We are all in this together, right? So you know what? When those kids aren't learning, guess who's there on Saturdays? We are. We're there on, we work all July. We do what we have to do because it is our job and we're professionals. And a professional does what they have to do until the job is done. Who created this system that is factory work? The whistle blows at 3 o'clock and whether the job is done or not, you stop. It is over. Who cares if those kids learn? Where did we get that system from? Well, see, that has doomed poor kids. And it has doomed poor kids all over America. Uh, and those of us who are trying to change that system to one where we can have accountability, and people keep telling me, you know, well, some charter schools aren't any good. Yes, some are not. Close them. But just because some one thing is not good, right? Can you imagine if that was our theory in life, right? You know, Palm Pilot, remember that? Right? Oh, bomb pilot, we don't like that no more. So then we stop? Nobody stops. You keep inventing things over and over and over again, right? In education, one failure, they say, stop everything. It won't work. We have to change that. Uh, I'm committed to doing that. That's uh, why I'm in the business I'm in, uh, why my wife puts up with me with my crazy schedule and the constant uh, yelling and screaming and traveling uh, around this country. Uh, and I would just like to leave, uh, you know, I, I write poetry for advocates, uh, and uh, I would like to uh, close with this poem that I wrote, which uh, really gets at this issue of accountability, which is called uh, Don't Blame Me. <laughs> the girl's mother said, don't blame me. Her father left when she was three. I know she don't know her ABCs, her one, two, threes, but I am poor and work hard, you see. You know the story. It's don't blame me. The teacher shook her head and said, don't blame me. I know it's sad. He's 10, but if the truth be told, he reads like he was six years old. And math, don't ask. It's sad, you see. Wish I could do more, but it's after three. Blame the mom, blame society, blame the system, just don't blame me. The judge was angry, his expression cold. He scowled and said, son, you've been told. Break the law again and you'll do time. You've robbed with a gun. Have you lost your mind? The young man opened his mouth to beg. Save your breath, he heard instead. Your daddy left when you were two. Your mama didn't take care of you. Your school prepared you for this fall. Can't read, can't write, can't spell at all. 
but you did the crime for all to see. You're going to jail, son. Don't blame me. If there is a God or a person supreme, a final reckoning for the kind and the mean, and judgment is rendered on who passed the buck, who blamed the victim, or who proudly stood up, you'll say to the world, while I couldn't save all, I did not let these children fall. By the thousands, I helped all I could see. No excuses. I took full responsibility. No matter if they were black or white, were cursed, ignored, were wrong or right, were short, were tall, I did my best to save them all. Then I will bear witness for eternity that you can state proudly, don't blame me. Thank you very much. Please join me in honoring all of our award winners tonight. Thank you, and good evening. I think it is clear how fortunate we are to believe in the power of ideas. Supply the common sense and the fresh thinking of the Manhattan Institute.